originated in 65 BC. Carpe diem is a Latin phrase that translates to seize the day. The sport of boxing generally provides few opportunities for fighters to make significant advances in their careers. For most, there may be just one or two occasions when they can seize the day. Roy Jones had one such chance four years ago when he took on undefeated champion James Tony. Roy was the underdog. Although also undefeated, he was thought by many too raw, too brash, too unproven. That fight was the one that set me off as the man in my division and proved that I was pound pound the best. Dominating from start to finish in a unanimous decision victory, Roy Jones was able to seize the day. Virgil Hill also had one such moment when he accepted a challenge from Thomas Hitman Hearns. Hill was undefeated at the time, yet largely unrecognized outside his native North Dakota. Would have put me into the superstardom category. But Hill was overmatched and suffered a unanimous decision defeat. Virgil Hill was unable to seize the day. Since the Tony fight, Roy Jones has dominated the 168 and 175 pound divisions. But the absence of big name opponents and an infrequent fight schedule has hurt his image and respectability as one of boxing's pound for pound best. Tonight's fight could be the beginning of Jones's journey back to the spotlight. For Virgil Hill, the picture is even clearer. If he defeats Roy Jones, he will automatically achieve the superstar identity that has eluded him his entire career. Two fighters with conflicting goals. Only one can be successful. As the Romans would say, carpe diem, seize the day. Mississippi Coast Coliseum and Convention Center in Biloxi, Mississippi. HBO Sports presents World Championship Boxing. And in a state in which the history of prize fighting goes back 116 years to the bare knuckles title fight in 1882 between Patty Ryan and John L. Sullivan, some of us may feel as though we've waited almost that long to see this battle tonight between Roy Jones Jr. and Virgil Hill. A light heavyweight fight which has been talked about for years and will finally take place tonight under our watchful eyes. A gorgeous weekend on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi. If ever you wanted to see this part of the world, Biloxi, Gulfport, Bay St. Louis, maybe sneak over to Mobile or New Orleans, this would have been the weekend to do it. Spectacular weather and great excitement as quite probably the largest live fight crowd ever to see a prize fight in the state of Mississippi fills this arena tonight to see Roy Jones return to the ring and do his stuff just a couple hours drive from his home in Pensacola. And hello again, hello again, everybody. I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome you to this edition of HBO's World Championship Boxing, one that we've waited for for quite some time because Roy Jones and Virgil Hill have been talked about as a likely light heavyweight matchup for three years or more. The fight finally takes place under unusual circumstances as Hill surrendered his version of the light heavyweight championship ten months ago to Darius Mikulszewski in Germany. And Roy Jones's governing body, despite his title belt, has identified him as a, quote, champion in recess, whatever that means. So there is no official title at stake tonight as the two best-known American light heavyweights get together face-to-face -to -face finally to see which one is the best. Working with me, as always, HBO boxing analyst Larry Merchant. And Larry, more has been made of Roy Jones's careful microscopic management of his career and his absence from ring activity in the last year and a half than anything he's done in the ring. To what do we owe the somewhat unexpected pleasure of his return to active fighting. 
El Nino, perhaps. <laughs> uh, the peace talks in Paris. Who truly knows with Roy Jones, who plays the role of the talented and tortured prima donna as well as he fights, which is very well indeed. To his credit, though, when the original fight scheduled for tonight, Whitaker versus Corte was canceled, it was Roy Jones who hadn't fought in nine months and seemed to want to go on indefinitely without a fight while proclaiming himself the best fighter in the world, he rode to the rescue. But one recent Roy Jonesism, Jim, he had a scheduled luncheon with an important United States Senator, John McCain, who was holding hearings on how to better regulate boxing. Great boxing fan, Senator McCain. Roy never showed up, stood him up. Senator, we surely know how you feel. But when he shows up in the ring, Jim, and the spirit moves him, he's as good as it gets. And Virgil Hill, who's waded through a couple of promotional appearances for this fight without seeing Roy to his satisfaction, does expect to see him in the ring tonight. And working with us, of course, HBO boxing expert and heavyweight legend George Foreman. George, uh, Roy Jones, previously identified as the world's best pound-for-pound -pound fighter, is rankled that in the past year, after his disqualification lost to Montel Griffin, and Oscar De La Hoya's five fights was moved back on that list in favor of De La Hoya by most boxing experts and publications. Roy says, hey, I'm still the best fighter. When we look at his skill and talent level, it's a strong argument. But does his inactivity, his absence from the ring, argue against his presumed status as the world's number one fighter? Well, first of all, Roy Jones is a gifted fighter. And you got you to gotta forget all about that. Uh, this gift was not bestowed upon him by critics. He earned it. He got it in the gym. He got the reputation in the ring. And the only way to keep that, stay in the gym, stay in the ring. Don't foxtrot, as Ronnie Spears would say, walk him down. All right. <laughs> Roy Jones is back in the ring tonight and ready to begin making his case again. He's not fighting Buster Douglas, as he had intimated he might. He's not fighting Oscar De La Hoya, as he may someday like to do. But he's back, so let's enjoy it. He's still a young man. Yet for five years already, he has been arguably the best fighter in the world, pound for pound. But in the past year and a half, he's been in the ring just twice. And now many in the boxing world question his desire to compete. So who really is Roy Jones? I think the public perception of Roy Jones, the boxer, is that he's a reluctant warrior. That uh, he doesn't really want to get into the ring. Boxing is not what it used to be, and I don't really love it like I used to because it's not a fair sport. Pay me what I asked for, boom, you got to end in them fights you want. If you don't give Roy what he wants, then they won't see Roy because it's not the public's fault. I mean, it's the people who pay Roy. The boxing world hasn't seen much of Roy Jones recently because, in his opinion, there's no one for him to fight. Since his domination of James Tony in 1994, Jones has been without an obvious rival to help drum up interest. In the 80s, Sugar Ray Leonard had Tommy Hearns, Roberto Duran, and Marvin Hagler. More recently, Oscar De La Hoya has had Julio Cesar Chavez and Pernell Whitaker, with Felix Trinidad and Ike Corte yet to come. Jones has no big-name nemesis. The fact that he hasn't had quality opponents has really uh, been a detriment to his career, more so than anything that, uh, that he has done himself. Uh, he hasn't done a lot to himself to, to, to de degenerate his career. The only thing that he has done to hurt himself is not be active. While Oscar De La Hoya fought five times last year and his popularity and market value soared, Jones virtually disappeared from the boxing scene. Recently, he hired Murad Muhammad as his promoter to help him regain the lost spotlight. He's got to come out to the public. He's got to make personal appearances. He's got to come to the media. He cannot go into isolation, and he must be active. But that, for Jones, is easier said than done. In his hometown of Pensacola, the $20 million he's already collected goes a long way, especially with a lifestyle as simple as Roy's. You know what I love to do? Stay at home, hunt fish, raise my chickens and dogs, and I love to fight when the circumstances are right. That's all. He has very few concerns outside, you know, when you, uh, outside of boxing um, um, here, and uh, it, it's a comfortable time for him here, and, and, and that may, may blunt his, his drive or his ambition. I don't think he's as motivated as he used to be, you know, because 
everybody knows it's harder to stay at the top than to get there. Once you get to the top, a lot of people want to relax and let their hair down. But that's when your work begins. In boxing, reluctance to get into the ring always raises the blunt question. Is the fighter simply afraid to get hit? I ain't afraid of nothing. Understand? I ain't afraid of nothing. Which would you rather have? The lack of fight hurt your market value or to have the battering and the anger and the discussion out of after you get out of, out of boxing, you can't talk. You have to have somebody walk with you everywhere you go. I'm going there as an athlete and I want to come out as an athlete. I don't want to come out as uh, this guy who can't think right and uh, I had this fight. And I ain't with that, you know? I want to come out Roy. Clearly, Roy Jones's priorities differ from those of most boxers. He has all the money he could ever need. He's invested it wisely, and he'll never have to fight for food and shelter. You got to understand that self-happiness, you can't buy. Fame money, you can buy. You can fool people. You can do a lot of things, get fame. You can do a lot of things, get money. You know what I'm saying? But self-happiness, you can't buy that. You got to live that. That's the only way you can be as happy as I am. Roy Jones is in an unusual position. He has the ability to control his own destiny, but he must decide if he wants to continue in his attempt to be remembered as one of boxing's all-time greats or as an athlete who ultimately placed self-happiness above that goal. And in just a few minutes, here live on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi, Jones will experience the self-happiness that goes with stepping into the ring against an opponent that the world has wanted him to fight for quite some time. Roy Jones against North Dakota's Virgil Hill. Larry, almost everybody agrees that this fight might best have taken place a few years ago when Hill would have been perceived to have more firepower to bring to the task. At age 34, with everything that's behind him, can Virgil Hill still make this fight meaningful for him now that it's here? Well, I think the conventional wisdom, Jim, is that he's Virgil over the hill. But this is his 15th year as a professional prize fighter, as a champion, and as a winner. And he has done the very unlikely thing of having turned the sausage department of boxing, the light heavyweight division, into steak for himself. Including tonight's purse, he will have made $4 million in his last three fights. Jim, he has the kind of skills that will bring out either the least or the beast in Roy Jones. And that's what this fight is about. He's a conventional boxer. He's a technician. He goes into this fight, George against Jones, giving up advantages in youth in speed, and most especially, it would appear, in power, where Hill has only 20 knockouts in his 43 fights. So given all of that, how could he conceivably win the fight? Well, most importantly, don't come here and put on a good show. Leave all of that jabbing and moving alone. Get in there, take a chance. You're not going to whip Rod Jones by boxing him. You're going to have to just put your gloves down, go toe-to-toe, -to -toe and pull it out. He can do it. He's as big. Why not? If he tries to do something unconventional, he has the motivation and the moral support of an entire state behind him. Maybe no athlete in America has a more direct relationship with his constituency than Virgil Hill. North Dakota, a prairie state dotted by closely knit small towns, understandably devoid of professional sport. It's been the lifelong home of Virgil Hill, who in a state without boxing tradition, began dreaming at age six of becoming a professional prize fighter. The odds were long, but Hill somehow constructed his own grassroots. I've been fortunate enough to have, be around people that, uh, teachers and coaches, they said anything was possible. You know, all you had to do is believe in yourself, sacrifice, and uh, you know, anything can come true. He said, you know, I want to be another Sugar Ray Leonard. I want to be a champion. And I said, well, you know, if you want to be a champion and you're aiming high, all you got to do is put the time in and give yourself the opportunity. Virgil certainly had a tremendous amount of, of uh, competitive, competitive drive within his own self, but we also tried to encourage that and, and maybe add a little fire to it. Virgil Hill took his modest state's proud faith in him to the 1984 Los Angeles Olympic Games, then defied the naysayers by returning home with a silver medal and sparking a romance that endures to this day. 
when he won the when he won the medal in the Olympics, he he uh, ran around the ring with the North Dakota flag, which was. Uh, a sign of somebody that had a little bit of character and cared about North Dakota. And when he became the first of that famed Olympic team to win a world title, North Dakota showed how much it cared about Hill. From the late 80s through the mid 90s, the 175 pound fighter put his unheralded state on the map by introducing international boxing here. Virgil Hill is undefeated in 22 prize fights in his home state. They had people camping out days ahead of time. Uh, they were buying up tickets as fast as they could get them. Now here is the most popular man in North Dakota. You get goosebumps. I have a whole state, you know, that, that follows me. 600,000 people in the whole state. I have a whole state when usually, you know, most people just have, you know, a city. North Dakota rises for Virgil Hill. There's people in North Dakota, believe it or not, right, you can walk down the street with a Virgil Hill t-shirt on and they'll invite you to dinner. The state's admiration mushroomed, and the new champ found support in the unlikeliest places. Virgil could come to my dry cleaners at any time of day and night, where I could get it in excess of 160 degrees, and he could shake out and do a little workout and some shadow boxing and have the whole place to himself. And with North Dakota's devotion behind him, the inspired local hero built a record of 20 successful title defenses. Virgil attributes his two long and successful championship reigns to the deep-rooted values typical of his upbringing. I developed my hard work ethic and stuff from, from North Dakota and, uh, and loyalty. I'm extremely loyal. Those homespun principles, combined with old-fashioned boxing fundamentals, have helped make Virgil the game's most decorated light heavyweight. He's also North Dakota's most revered public figure. Yet the prairie icon purposely stays humble by remembering the values of the community that nurtured him. He's always given acknowledgement to where he came from and the kind of people that, that uh, helped mold him and shape his personality and his work ethic. The people make you. And that's why I've been able to go to North Dakota and stuff, because the people come. You know, they want me there. And so I like doing it. It's great. Tonight, Virgil Hill steps into a ring many miles away from home and finds himself again in the role of underdog, but shielded as always by the spirit and pride of North Dakota. One tiny disclaimer as we bring you back live. He hasn't actually lived full-time in North Dakota for several years, splitting time between California, Missouri, Las Vegas, New Jersey, where he trains, but that doesn't diminish his connection to his home state. Tale of the tape between Roy Jones and Virgil Hill. And you'll see that Jones is already 29 years old, but Hill is giving up five years in age. Hill with a two-inch listed height advantage they weighed in at an agreed-upon limit of 177 and a half pounds. Jones, one pound under Hill, a half pound under. The weigh-in took place at 10.30 last night because Jones was concerned about how much time Hill would have to gain weight between the weigh-in and tonight's scheduled fight. Reach, four-inch advantage for Hill, and he'll have to find a way to use it to have a chance to win the fight. Punch stat numbers, Larry. These are power punches. Roy Jones lives and lives very well off of his power punching. Hill is not a power puncher. It should be pointed out, however, that since he became a light heavyweight, Jones throws about 50% fewer punches than he did as a middleweight. Fewer punches than Hill usually does. And these are the jabs. That's the main weapon of Hill. It's not a weapon at all for Roy Jones. Rules of the bout with our unofficial ringside scorer, Harold Letterman. The Roy Jones Virgil Hill fight is scheduled for 12 rounds using the rules of the Mississippi State Athletic Commission. A little bit different tonight, Jim. The standing eight count is in effect. The three knockdown rule is in effect. Only the referee can stop the fight, and you can be saved by the bell in the 12th and final round only. Jim. Harold has been the scourge of the Gulf Coast beaches in his all-out yellow shorts this weekend. And now here comes Virgil Hill into the ring. His last seven fights, incidentally, have all gone the distance. Mark of the absence of punching power that George and I discussed just a short time ago. Likes his privacy a lot. 
And of course, if you want to be private, there's no better place to hide out than in the light heavyweight division. <laughs> Third on the all-time list of successful title fight defenses, behind only Joe Lewis and Julio Cesar Chavez. Imagine that. This man is number three all-time in the history of the sport for the number of times he successfully defended a title. Overall record for Virgil Hill, 43 wins, losses to Thomas Hearns and Darius Mikulszewski, only 20 KOs. Twice he won light heavyweight championships of the world. More than half of his fights, title fights. We mentioned the first of the 1984 Olympic team to win a world title, and you saw the picture. Freeland, Biggs, Meldrick Taylor, Pernell Whitaker. It was a star-studded team. Evander Holyfield as well. Roy doing his rap number. Hard to tell the lyrics, but I've read them and they all add up to I love me. <laughs> Y'all can be the fans and we'll just be the superstar. Roy Jones, 35 wins, the one loss, the controversial disqualification against Montel Griffin in the ninth round last March. He avenged that with a first round knockout of Griffin, one of 30 KOs on his record. We invite you to check out our boxing website at www.hbo.com slash boxing. Check stats, score at home, be just like Harold Letterman, or chat with other fans. That's www.hbo.com slash boxing, our boxing website. Now let's go to Michael Buffer for the official introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Biloxi, Mississippi, courtesy of the Grand Casinos. Where tonight, Murad Mohammed, Eminem Sports Incorporated, Square Ring Incorporated, and Cedric Kushner Promotions, in, along with your undisputed, undefeated king of beers, Budweiser. This Bud's for you. Present an evening of world-class professional boxing. Twelve rounds in the light heavyweight division, sanctioned by the Mississippi State Athletic Commission, Chairman Billy Lyons. Chief Deputy Assistant, Sal Toronto. The three physicians at ringside are Dr. Bob Middleton, Dr. Lance Barnes, and Dr. Todd Coulter. Timekeeper, David Toronto. Counting for the knockdown seconds, Denver Anderson. The scoring will be done on a 10-point must basis, and the three judges assigned are Elmo Adolph, C.D. Jenkins, and Paul Sita. And when the bell rings, the man in charge of the action, your referee, Fred Steinwander III. And now, for the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Introducing first, Fighting out of the blue corner, wearing black, trimmed with silver, and weighing in at 177 pounds. In 1984, he captured silver at the Olympics in Los Angeles, and now as a professional, he has an outstanding record consisting of 43 victories with 20 knockouts and only two losses. And for 10 years, he held two world title belts. From Bismarck, North Dakota, here is the former two-time light heavyweight champion of the world, Virgil Quicksilver Hill. And across the ring in the red corner, wearing gold and weighing 176 and one half pounds, 
this 1988 Olympic silver medalist also has an outstanding professional record. Four world titles in four divisions, scoring 30 knockouts in his 35 victories, with the only blemish coming by way of a controversial disqualification. To this day, he has never been defeated by an opponent. He is considered by the experts to be, pound for pound, the best in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, from Pensacola, Florida, presenting the four-time world champion, Roy Jones Jr. instructions early in the dressing room. I want you to listen to my commands at all times. Protect yourselves at all times. Touch gloves, come out fighting. Good luck to both of y'all. Are we going to have a go for as advertised for this match or are we going to get the Biloxi Blues? Roy, I guess, insisted on that introduction as having never been defeated by an opponent regarding his disqualification loss as self-inflicted. Major Burr under his saddle. Saw the 305 days inactive for Virgil Hill coming in. Maybe that's good because he was bothered by injury in his loss to Mikhlashevsky, particularly a tendon injury on the bottom of his foot that made it extremely painful for him to step forward. Here, he's going to have to step lively. Hill immediately using his jab to the body, George. And you know it's strange because Roy Jones Jr. doesn't wear his cup above his navel. That's what you want to do is get that cup up there so you can protect yourself as much as possible as though he's not even afraid of uh, body punching. Jones coming out aggressive in the first round. Not waiting to see, or check it, Hill coming out aggressive, I should say. Not waiting to see what Jones is going to do. And that jab is going to the body and to the chest. And he is simply trying to land it, George, which you often prescribe in this situation. Yeah, because if the fight goes beyond two or three rounds, you've been hit in the chest, there's no knockout power for you. So you do not allow the guy to touch your chest, your body. Roy obviously trying to throw that quick right hand over the jab, trying to time Hill's jab. almost with his back against the ropes repeatedly in the nine round fight against Griffin he backed up into the ropes and allowed Griffin to wail away at him he did it also against McCallum he says it's a viable tactic which he uses to bide his time and wear his opponents down quick left hook up top by Jones best punch of the fight so far for him if you're going to come out throwing those big heavy shots you got to make sure no one touches your body because it takes a lot of your strength away. Virgil Hill, as we pointed out, trying early simply to touch Jones's body, particularly with his left jab. And Jones is standing still, allowing him to do as much. Jones stepping in and firing a single left hook. Hill coming back and struggling to try to land a jab in the right hand. Another quick left hand shot by Jones, and he lands a right over the top. Another right hand, and Jones is starting to get it going in the last minute of round number one. This guy, Virgil Hill, has been hit by one of the best right-hand punchers in the business, Hitman Hearn. And he's able to withstand those heavy blows. Here you go. Both fighters close to slipping as they exchange punches along the ropes. Jones has gotten his offense going in the last minute of the round, has landed several hard left and right hand shots. Hill has stuck to his knitting, trying to land his jab and work to the body throughout the round. That right hand working over his jam. That's good. Okay. Then take his mouth through. That's good. That's good. Way to count him with that right hand. You're doing good. Just let's keep it like that. Keep it like that. You have him with that left uppercut, too. Right. You got a good angle on it. Mm -hmm. Way to work. You stay in front. 
too long, right? Little side step over, little side step over, keep that left hand busy. Alright? Faint and go, faint and go. Alright? Nice deep breath. Keep them hands up. Alright, keep turning, keep turning. That right hand go, Hill refers contemptuous, contemptuously of Jones as the Wonder Boy, and he fought him with a little contempt in that first round, I thought, George. Yeah, every time Jones touched him with something, he'd go right back to the body. I think that's a lot of good skill there. You can keep your mind on your strategy. Hill landed 17 of 42 jabs in the first round. Almost all of those 17 connects to the body where he's been focusing his attack. You can see him coming out in round two with the same thing. Jones lands a right hand flush on the cheek, up top. Jones only threw 37 punches in round one. He likes to work in a staccato rhythm. Bunch of punches, followed by a lull. Then another bunch of punches. And Hill is doing a good job. He boxes when Jones wants to stand still. When Jones standing still, he'll start move, uh, moving forward. You fight him when he want to box, and you box him when he want to fight. Hill continually sticking that jab to the body, momentarily backing Jones up, and he steps away. And Jones often is not, not firing back. Jones choosing his occasions for stepping in with quick left hooks up top or the right-hand lead. Another right-hand lands for Jones. Hill has taken all the power shots pretty well so far. Yeah, and that's not really good for Roy Jones Jr. to throw that much power early in the fight, knowing that this fight could go on and on and on. This guy is able to really recover good from a, a shot, Virgil Hill. And he goes right back to that midsection. That's not good. For Jones, it is. That's not good for Roy Jones Jr. In other words, it's good for Hill. So you like Hill's fight plan so far, George? So far, he's catching a lot of shots, but of course, he's been shot by a genuine light heavyweight. I mean, a uh, middleweight. He's been in there with the big light heavyweights for the last few years. So even though Roy hasn't fought at 160 for a few years now, you still think of him fundamentally as a middleweight? Yeah, you look at Virgil Hill, look at the size of those legs, the calves. He's been caught with some good shots, but believe me, there's not enough weight behind him yet. Jones landing with sharp lefts and rights. Now he's starting in round two to occasionally look to put together combinations. For the most part up to now, it's been one punch at a time. Hill still focusing on trying to land his jab to Roy Jones' chest. Yeah, he's believing that he's going to take a lot of the juice out of that power of Roy Jones. And he's taking the chances, as we said early on. He has got to get out there and take a chance. Can't worry about the scars on your face. Can't worry about getting cut. This is your chance, chance of a lifetime. There's leaping left hooks landing for Roy Jones. Hill doggedly sticking to the plan, keeping his left jab in Jones's chest. Now he comes back up top and backs Roy into the ropes. Two rounds in the books. I know. I push my stomach. Listen to me. Don't worry about hitting him hard. He can take a pretty good shot. Right. Just, just touch him. Right. Just touch him. Right. Then all of a sudden, give me some power. We right. get this turkey out of here. Right. Now, he reaching for your right, your jab when you throw to the body. He reaching for him. Right. Make the jab to the body. Let him come down with that right hand throw your hook. You'll catch him. I guarantee you, Roy. Right. Every time you throw that jab to the body, right. he reaches down for The him. crowd has been turned on by May. many of these long punches by Roy Jones, but most of them are missing. They are not connecting. And you wonder what influence that will have on the judges. Even that punch was not a clean punch. Once that numbers through two rounds, Jones has landed 34 of 68, 50% connect percentage, according to CompuBox observations. Virgil Hill, 35 out of 80. 44%. Harold Letterman gives each of the first two rounds to Roy Jones on his card. There you go, nice hook. And you heard
heard Alton Merkerson suggesting to Jones that Hill is reaching for his jab, so if he fakes the jab to the body and comes upstairs with the left hook, he'll do some damage. Yeah, he can do some damage, but he's not going to get what Jones is accustomed to getting, knockdowns like that. He's going to have to touch him a little bit, just find the man so that you can get the big shot. Virgil Hill is very solid, keeps his footwork, bends his knee when he jabs, all of the things that's necessary to, to counteract all of this uh, uh, unorthodox stuff Jones is doing. You know, frequently we get the impression early in fights that Roy doesn't have it in him. He's not trying to get at his opponent, but I have the impression tonight that he's working hard and really looking for an opening to make something happen. I and agree. He's even using his left jab this time. That's something he doesn't like to do. And as Hill has the right with. hand, Jones shakes his head as if to say, I can't do damage to me. But first has a jab. He has a jab, Roy Jones does. And Hill still just trying to keep his glove on Jones. Jones lands the left, but it's good jab at a time. Now there's the combination. Jab and right hand. Hill lands the right hand over the top in retaliation. Good right hand by Jones, and I thought that momentarily stunned Hill. He may be getting a little too brave. Yeah, you just can't catch him all night long. Sometimes you got to start moving your head left and right. Hill does best when he gets off first and goes to the body. But Hill has done a good job if this fight goes another couple of rounds. He's put in the investment in the chest and the stomach to keep some of the power out of this man in the long range. When Hill steps up and then waits for Jones to do something, oh, Jones is able to land. So Hill's plan has to be to get off when he goes forward. It's going to take energy. He hasn't thrown one right hand with authority yet, Virgil Hill. Nope. Not one right hand. Oh, He's landed oh, 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 a couple, but they were yeah, pawing efforts over the top. That was a little controversy about the gloves early on. When a guy is that concerned about gloves, oh, well, that means there's maybe something wrong with one hand back. or another. They finally settled on the long sun grayish gloves just a few hours before fight time. Harold Letterman said that Roy Jones would try his overhand right. Right hand shot by Jones as the round comes to a close. Virgil Hill stopping Jones in his track with the left hand. Okay, you don't, you don't warm down a little bit now. Look, you hit me with his jab with your jab. He knew your jab. The one-two is working. Just stick to that. Just keep that shooting that one-two. If you hurt him bad, if you hurt him bad with your right hand, go ahead and follow up. Until the end, just give me the one-two. Give me the one-two. But you, you're dominating with the jab. You hit him with the jab now. You got him froze. He, he had his fight plan. Stick with the jab and the one-two. If you hit him with a one-two and he curl, go down and get your body real strong, okay? Okay, give me a little rim. Jones, his popular trainer, Alton Merkerson, saw his son, Ron, drafted out of Colorado in the fifth round by the New England Patriots last week. Inside linebacker. Here comes Hill to begin round four against Roy Jones. Virgil Hill is doing a lot of footwork, and when you got the power and the size like that, you got to move forward. You don't need to box. Harold Letterman, how do you have it scored through the first three? Jim, I got it 3-0, 30-27, to 27, Roy Jones Jr. Jim, I got to tell you, it's the boxer against the puncher, and unless Freddie Steinbinder is hitting Virgil Hill, somebody's making Virgil Hill's eyes swell up. I'm telling you, Roy Jones is not missing him with that right hand. He's whacking him with it. He constantly throws a right-hand lead that lands on the left side of Virgil Hill's head, and it's hurting Virgil Hill. No question. Virgil Hill is popping the chair, but just like Foreman said, he doesn't throw a right hand behind it. So far, it's Jones's power over Hill's chair. Ooh! Right to the body, down Unheard of! Unheard of! Only the third time Hill's ever been down. He's holding the kidney area on the right side. Yeah. And Steinbinder the fight. First time Virgil Hill's ever been knocked out. Roy Jones did punch. it with a right hand to the body. Yeah. I've seen it all. 
one of the few hard body shots I can recall Roy Jones ever throwing, much less ending a fight with. Unheard of. Normally not a body puncher. Didn't he knock out Glenn Wolf with a body shot as well? A long time ago back in Vegas? Well, I said one of the few. But he never has done it against a world-class opponent I that I can recall. This is a world-class opponent being knocked out by a body shot. This is one heck of a body shot. I mean, this was a perfect, clean shot to the right of the ribcage. And here's another look. Larry, tell us about this, please. <laughs> well, it was just a sudden shot uh, underneath the jab instead of over the jab. Uh, through the first three rounds, Virgil Hill had been seeing Roy throw the punch, throw the right hand over the jab. This time he elected to throw it under the jab and just caught him in a very vulnerable spot. What does it feel like, George? What does it feel like when you get hit there? Boy, I tell you, there's nothing like it because it actually paralyzes your body for the second. All you're thinking about is recovering from the pain. And that's what he's thinking, how do I recover? Okay. It's not about defending yourself. Fighters describe that to me as feeling as though a knife has just been passed through your ribs. It's paralyzing it because it takes your breath. And from the waist down, your legs can't move, right? Yeah, it's shock. It's physical shock. So a lightning knockout on the fourth round for Roy Jones. One punch knockout on a body punch. And quickly, let's go up to Michael Buffer for the official particulars on this one. And referee Fred Steinwinder III calls a halt to the bout. Following the 10 count, the official time, one minute, 10 seconds of round number four. The winner by knockout victory from Pensacola, Florida, he is Roy Jones Jr. A significant campaign stop in Roy Jones's bid to be seen as the best pound-for-pound -pound fighter in the world. He knocks out an excellent, well-conditioned opponent, Virgil Hill, with a body shot in the fourth round. And George Foreman, uh, that in the eyes of some is going to bolt him back to the top of the heap. I tell you, as I said, Ronnie Spears said, you can't box trot. He was flat-footed, and he hurt this guy. Final punch stat numbers. CompuBox observations show Roy Jones landing 34 of 69 power punches. That's pretty much his norm. He lands more than half of his power punches. And Virgil Hill only threw 30, landing only 11. And you saw those right hands, which were not heavy blows. Jabs, you know, and of course, this is window dressing for Jones, who doesn't normally use the stick that much, but went to it in the third and fourth rounds tonight when trainer Alton Merkerson asked him to do so. So he built his stats up on the jab, landing an uncharacteristically high 49%. Virgil Hill was doing what he wanted with, with his jab for the first three rounds. He couldn't keep Jones away from him when it mattered most in the fourth. Let's go to Larry Merchant with the winner. All right, and the winner is Roy Jones. Congratulations, Roy. Frequently we've seen in your fights that if you don't hurt the guy in the first round, you look to settle down, settle down, get him when you can. But it seemed you were much more intense from the start Till that dramatic finish tonight. Have fault. Well, first of all, I take time out to thank God for giving me the strength, the wisdom, the help around me, supply me with the people and the utilities to do what I do. But uh, what it was was, I came. I haven't fought in a while. You know, I've been a little rusty, haven't been doing anything. So I want to get myself into the groove. Of it. But I know that I'm too powerful for Virgil here. I was much too strong. I'm a big puncher. So I figured, why waste time boxing? If I box, that's what he wants to do. Don't box him. Let's go get him. Okay. Now we want to talk to you about the punch that ended. You're not noted as a body puncher. But throughout the fight, it seemed, you were throwing right hands over his jab. At that occasion, it was under it. So let's take a, a look at a replay of what happened there. And you describe it. Was well, it a kidney punch? Working in, I don't know what it is. A good, that's a good body shot there. It's right on the side. I mean, it could be called whatever, kidney punch or whatever. But when I go up on his jab and throw my punches, I can't sit there and guide it. I mean, I don't care what he called it. In boxing, we have to take those. I get hit with them all the time. And in fact, I get hit further back than that. That's a legal shot to me because that's... No, no, it's, it is a legal oh, shot. Oh. Nobody is claiming otherwise. Okay, okay. But, but were you conscious of the fact that you had been throwing right hands over his jab and that he was opening up for that underneath. Very much so. That's why that's the first right body shot I threw the whole fight because I wanted to get him used to jabbing and stuff. I knew he was going to keep jabbing. I was trying to hit him over the top, but I said, since I can't go over the top, let's go underneath, baby. 
Up until that point, were you surprised that he was as aggressive behind his jab as he was? No, because that's basically his best punch was, is his jab. I knew he had a good jab. I knew his jab would cause some problems early because Virgil Hill has been noted his entire career for a jab. He's a boxer. So when you fight a, the, the whole thing is you fight a boxer and you box a fighter. He's a boxer, so I had to fight him. I don't go into our jab. I go in to beat him. Normally, when you go into a ring with a guy with a guy like this, you're content to let the pace play out, as I observed before. Were you looking for some dramatic statement because you are very jealous of your reputation, which people were tending to forget because you had been away from the ring for so long? Uh, no, it's just I haven't fought in a while, and I think some people probably thought that, well, he's probably slacking now, and we probably can beat him, so let's try him. Uh, I wanted to fight Virgil long ago, as you know, but if the fight never materialized, so I said, you know what, I'm going to go out here tonight. I'm not going to box Virgil because he's a boxer. I'm going to go ahead and fight him and get the fight over with. Just one more question about that body punch, because it was so devastating, and, and it's so seldom that we see a one-punch body punch knockout. Were you aware, while the fight was going on, that... A body punch can be that devastating, mm -hmm. even because we've—I don't remember the last time you have done anything like that. Let me tell you something. See, this is why I know that I am pound for pound the best fighter in the world. I don't like to argue, but I beat the best fighters. You know what I'm saying? You stop Virgil here in three rounds. Yeah. I mean, come on. You know what I'm saying? That tells you I'm a good punch. I'm a good fighter. I don't even argue with it no more. You know, I just sit back and take it easy. I love doing what I do. I love the Gulf Coast. I love the whole world. I love all my fans. I appreciate boxing and performing for people. Some people, some people, including your own trainer, have questioned whether you, whether you still have the passion to be the best and to do what you do. Are you saying now that after a fight like this against a world-class opponent that you feel that great feeling you had when you were younger in the ring? No, I don't have that feeling still. I mean, it's hard to get that feeling, especially when you're at home training. you got a lot of distractions. I dealt with a lot of distractions before this fight. I've been dealing with a lot of distractions for a long time now. And, uh, you know, if I'm happy, if the situation is right for me, then I can get that feeling back. Right now, that situation is not really the best, so I'm just doing what i got to do to get by. Who do you think you're going to fight next, Roy? I don't know. Whoever HBO decides they want me to fight, if they come get with me, Murata, whoever, Fred 11, Stan 11, all of us are still together. Get with us. Let us know what they want to do. I'm always interested in performing for people. You know, I'm a good fighter. I I enjoy what I do. I thank God for giving me the talent to do what I do. I love the fight. I just want the conditions to be right for Roy Jones Jr. because after boxing, Roy Jones Jr. does have a life to live still. So I want my situation the best for me, and I can do what I got to do. Thank you very much, Roy. You know, Roy often talks about his humble, quiet life on the farm outside of Pensacola, but coming into this fight, he insisted on a Rolls Royce from the backers of the fight. That was a Rolls Royce of a body punch. Jim? All right, Larry, and for the last totally academic observation, all three judges had Jones with a shutout, winning each of the first three rounds, up to the point of the knockout. Speculation is that the next appearance will be against a man named Graziano Roshigiani, who is, despite his name, a German. He's one of the three light heavyweight champions of record along with Reggie Johnson and Louis Deval. So there's a message out on the boxing internet tonight for fighters like Oscar De La Hoya and Prince Nassim and Evander Holyfield and any other contenders for that best pound-for-pound -pound fighter in the world title. He's back, Roy Jones, with another thunderous knockout. We'll have a final word on what happened here in the ring in just a moment. Now let's look ahead to some upcoming programs on HBO. To destroy your enemy. You must find him, face him, and then become him. Nicholas Cage. This is between us. John Travolta. Whee! <laughs> face off, Saturday, May 2nd. Somebody once said, a little hard work never hurt anyone. Tell that to these guys. Undefeated sensation Sugar Shane Mosley punches in with a vengeance to defend his title against season slugger John John Molina, the man who went the distance with the Golden Boy. Plus, it's his toughest job yet. See if Olympic hero David Reed continues his golden winning streak in a rumble with Nick Rupa. Live Saturday, May 9th. Hard work might hurt, but it pays off. HBO Boxing After Dark. 
Boxing After Dark continues May 30 with a heavyweight doubleheader featuring two of the division's brightest prospects, Michael Grant, who will take on Obed Sullivan, and Chris Bird, who will meet Eliezer Castillo. And join us May 19 for the next installment of Real Sports with Brian Gumbel, featured in this edition, an investigative report on the continued use and possible risks of chewing tobacco among Major League Baseball players. A profile of the original exercise guru, Jack LaLanne, still going strong at 83. What a beauty. Plus a hard-hitting examination of how the new Arizona Diamondback Stadium was financed with public tax dollars without ever allowing taxpayers to vote on the issue. Real sports where nothing is out of bounds. Just a few moments ago here on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, Roy Jones knocked out Virgil Hill at 110 of the fourth with a vicious body shot in what we imagine is a matter of routine observation. Virgil Hill has been taken away in an ambulance to go to a nearby hospital. We are told there's a possibility that Hill has a broken rib, and if so, he'll be treated for that at the hospital. Coming up immediately following tonight's coverage of World Championship Boxing, stay tuned for HBO Comedy Half Hour Jeff Stilson, followed by Hollow Point on the East Coast and the premiere of Selena on the West Coast. So now for Larry Merchant, George Foreman, and Harold Letterman, I'm Jim Lapley saying so long from the Mississippi Coast Coliseum and Convention Center in Biloxi, Mississippi. The executive producer of HBO Sports is Ross Greenberg. Tonight's telecast World Championship Boxing was produced by Rick Bernstein and directed by Mark Payton. The feature producers were Adam Berger and Max Siegel. The associate producer, Kendall Reed. Assistant to the producer, Thomas Erdelfelt. The production manager was John McKelly. And the technical supervisor was Bob Hunter. This has been a presentation of HBO Sports, the network of champions.